I'm Jackson Benvenuti, and we have uh, John Bowden with us here. Uh, um, we are uh, going to ch chat a little bit about Charleston Race Week. Um, Uh-oh, this thing got frozen. Great. Oh, here we go. Um, I lived in Charleston for a while. I went to the college there and sailed on the team. Uh, lived there for a few years afterwards, probably a total of about 10 years. And uh, Charleston's a place that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, John's been there for quite a while. John, how long have you lived in Charleston? Uh, I moved to Charleston in 2001, went to the College of Charleston as well, um, and been in the sail making business there for the last, I guess we're coming up on 20 years here. Or um, So, um, been, you know, you're, you're never a local from Charleston unless you're three generations in, but uh been in Charleston for a long time and I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, it's a great place. It's a great place. So here's our contact information. If you have any questions about this later after the <laughs> webinar or you want to get in touch with us, please don't hesitate to reach out. We're, we're happy to help. That's why we're here. So uh, before the regatta, John, you've got a little party at the loft, don't you? We do. Uh, Urban Grove and I, uh, we run the North Sales Charleston loft uh, down on 3 Lockwood Drive on Wednesday night. From four to six, we are going to have a bit of an open house. Um, Kyle Martin will be there displaying uh, a lot of the North performance gear. We'll have our trailer there so you guys can check that out. Uh, we also have a lot of people that are buying new sales for the event. Um, and so we'll have pickup available at that time for anybody that's ordering new sales. Just be a good chance. Come by, say hello. Um, you know, if you have any questions after this, um you know happy to happy to help you answer them we can look at charts we can look at you know local stuff if you have any questions about where to eat where to go what to do um a lot of people are there be there to um to hang out and um you know answer your questions oh that's great that's great yeah be a good time those parties are always fun uh mm -hmm. Maybe sneak over to Salty Mike's afterwards. It's right next yeah, maybe, to you know, Maybe a little Salty Mike's afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Local sailor haunt. Yeah. So this is kind of the, the lay of the land here. Um, we have a few locations. Obviously, this is the North Sales Loft, right? Right where we were just talking about. Um, this is where the regatta venue is, the aircraft carrier on Patriots Point. Um, James Island Yacht Club. We'll talk about that in a little bit and a few other locations, but here's, here's your sailing venue right about here. Um, depending on what course you're on, there's three courses, I think, right, John? Uh, there, there, well, there'll be, there'll be five courses, uh, throughout the regatta course one, two, and three will be the local inshore courses. We'll have the pursuit course and then the, uh, offshore ORC courses, um, the other thing to mention, we couldn't put in there, um, uh, right by the North sales loft is where the Charleston Yacht Club's located. It'll be one of the venues for launch and haul. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more on the logistics page, but yeah, this kind of gives you a little bit of the, you know, place, nothing, nothing is very far. Um, you know, the distance from downtown to, to Patriots point where the regatta venue is, um it's not more than about six miles it shouldn't take you more than about 10 15 minutes to drive um a lot of options um as we, as we run through logistics we can talk about that a little more and more gotcha um so the regatta venue over here at patriots point that's a bit of a, a newer it's always been on patriots point but now we're at a different uh venue <clears throat> we there last year but it's a little bit different this year right yeah so uh you know we kind of have we're calling it the new Charleston Race Week. Um, Patriots Point uh, Naval Maritime Museum stepped up as a title sponsor uh, for Charleston Race Week. Last year, we ran the regatta out of out of the aircraft carrier, the USS Yorktown, um, sort of as a trial run as we transitioned away from the marina, the beach and the hotel. Um, but Mount Pleasant and the museum have really stepped up became title sponsors and they've, they've given us the venue um, for the foreseeable future. It's, it's a great opportunity. Um, as many of these big regattas go forward um, to, to have some security, to know that the, the future of the event is, is, is in good shape. Um, we, we've seen you know regattas come and go, but we, we now know that Charleston Race Week's here to stay. 
with, with the securing of Patriots Point um, Museum and the Yorktown as our as our title venue, title sponsor, and you know regatta venue, we know now that we can we can host this regatta in perpetuity, and we'll continue to to have it run it. Uh, you know, I know there were some people that were disappointed that we were off the beach, but I think this is a great opportunity for us to see a different venue. Um, last year, we we had, you know, it was a trial run. We hosted the event kind of in a small space, but the the venue has given us full run of the whole entire Yorktown, which is, you know, gives us an aircraft carrier to play with. I think as as the regatta expands and grows and and learns, you know, the things that we can do and and use um, off that aircraft carrier it will be incredible. Um, I think you know we've run a a pro am regatta out of Charleston, you know, before uh, from the other marina, and being able to view that from the top of an aircraft carrier would be truly unbelievable. So, I think everybody everybody should be excited and um, pumped to go see this venue it's it's a cool museum but uh it's also a fun place to hang out so i'm looking forward to seeing what randy drafts and charleston race week has put together for us because i i know it will be truly stunning and uh like i said for for local charleston people this this does mean the security of the event and and we know we'll be able to to host it for for many years to come so we're everybody's super excited about it yeah, Randy, Randy really does a great job with this regatta. I can't say enough things about that. And I mean, playing on an aircraft carrier, how often do you get to do that? That's pretty yeah. well. Pretty yeah. neat. Pretty neat. So here are a few locations where people will likely launch and haul their boats. Um, you know, John, you're still living in Charleston. Maybe you can give us a little bit of rundown of each one. Yeah, these, these are the same organizations that have been helping us for years and years. Um, Charleston Yacht Club is the local yacht club downtown, um, offers launch and haul for, for a wide variety of boats, um, it, kind of anything smaller than a Melgus 32. We have uh, occasionally some draft constraints at low tide. Um, that's why the Melgus 32s work well with the lifting keel. Um, James Allen Yacht Club also does a very nice job for the J88s, the J80s, um, and J70s. They, they've got a they've got a bit more water, but reach out to these people. Cooper River Boatyard is our large boatyard for launch and haul. Cape 31s, um, you know anything bigger than that? J105s, things that require a travel lift or crane. Um, and also one venue that should not be forgotten is uh, Remley's Point. Uh, it's a public boat landing. Um, VXs, Vipers, you know, anything that can be hauled um, on a ramp, power boats, coach boats. Uh, Remley's Point's a great spot. Um, it's free. Pretty close to Patriots use. Point too, right? Very, very close to Patriots Point, just on the other side of the Cooper River Bridge. So mm -hmm. um, anybody who hasn't been to Charleston before, keep an eye on these locations. Um, you know, the logistics in Charleston can be a bit tricky. Um, and so these are definitely some locations that will help make your week easier. Right, right. And Charleston Yacht Club is pretty much in the same spot as the loft, right? Yep, exactly. Pretty much on the other side of the parking lot. So that's yep. convenient. Yeah. So we just have a few, the three days that we'll be racing, we have the uh, the high tides, low tides, and then also the, <clears throat> the uh, velocity and uh, speed speed and uh timing of when the slack and max ebb and max flood all is here um so on the one on the left the tide you know the difference between high tide and low tide is about four feet give or take right is is that normal for charleston is that is that a, is that a large amount or a low amount um this is charleston race week is one of the rare uh regattas where we we base the timing of of the event around the tides right this is the smallest tide that charleston can have a four foot tide is it is is literally the smallest tide that charleston can ever have we typically have anywhere from a you know four to eight foot tide and so we're, we're right on the very bottom edge um but if you also look at when slack tide is slack tide has really been scheduled as best as possible, uh, we can control the moon um, around, you know, the first start of the first race of the regatta. 
um, slack tides at 1123 um, on Friday morning, which will give us sort of the most neutral tide for the longest period of time. As we <clears throat> scroll through these, you know, the days, we can notice that the tide changes about 50 minutes later every day. Um, and, and so keep an eye on it. Um, keep an eye on these tide times. Look at your particular race course and see how the current reacts on your particular race course. Uh, one of the things about tides that anybody um, sailing in any of these high tide venues knows, tide charts are never right. And, and so they, while they may not be right, they are consistently wrong. Um, if the tide changes, if the tide starts running on your race course a little bit different, you can expect to see that same change the very next day um with that with that 50 minute delay and so um charleston is a, is a venue where tide can be a big topic of conversation but i will tell you <clears throat> the local sailors while they love to be great at local sailing um the best sailors do succeed here um through paying attention to what the tide's doing on their particular race course and unfortunately there's no tide chart for circle one, circle two, or circle three. So expect right. that, expect something different every day. Um, and, but just, you know, recognize how it changes and, and react accordingly. Right. You and these, uh, these locations are at Fort Johnson, which is mm -hmm. on the South side of the Harbor, um, not Fort Sumter, not to be confused with Fort Sumter. Um, so it's pretty close to, I think the the Southern tip of the circle two, the middle circle in the Harbor. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes these things can be influenced, especially by rain. If it's raining a lot, even farther upstate, you'll probably have a little bit of an extended ebb for a little while, and it yeah. might take a little longer for the flood to come in, right? So there's, there's always variances and there's always things you got to pay attention to, right? Um, is there anything else that might influence the, the, the timing of this stuff, John? Yeah, I mean... You know, just like any venue, I think rain, you know, rain is, a, is probably our biggest factor. Um, all of the Charleston Harbor is fed into by three rivers. And so if we get a, a decent rains in uh, any of the watershed of those rivers, they can have a big impact. Um, but we also do see a pretty big impact from the wind. If we see the wind blowing hard um, out of the southeast, we could see a change in that um, in that tide change time. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, again, kind of for me as, as a, as a, as a quasi local, um, you know, I, I just look for what the tide is doing on the starting line, what it's doing on the ley lines, what it's doing, you know, a, around the marks and just how it's speeding up or slowing down throughout the day. Um, <clears throat> I think most of the race courses, are in such a place where we don't see a change in direction. And I think we can go to, Jackson's got some great slides with the, with the charts here um, that we can talk about, you know, sort of the change in directions. Um, you know, we can see obviously the tide direction is pretty straightforward. You know, it's coming out of the rivers, going to the ocean, Right. So, um, so on this, an, on is the, tide. this is the Cooper River, right? Yeah, it's a Cooper so the and the Cooper River Cooper down and the Wando River, and then we have the Ashley River right. to the right. south. Um, and this one, the Cooper River is a bit stronger, right? It's the bigger river, more water coming out of it. The Cooper River is is the big channel for um, our shipping traffic, and so with the last round of dredging, um, we've seen the Cooper River. Um, We've seen the Cooper River deepened uh, to 55 to 60 feet deep. And so <clears throat> I would expect to see that river flowing much quicker than any other areas. Um, but as it is the main ship channel, we try, well, the race committee make sure that we don't um, put any racing marks inside that channel. But just knowing that it's there, um, Jackson's pointed out a pretty big shallow spot um just next to the cooper river this this area is generally out of the race course um but you can see the the it actually goes from about seven feet deep on one side of the green 
channel markers to 60 feet um, within a couple of feet. Um, uh, the chips square these channels off pretty hard. And so, um, you know, taking a look at these charts, knowing where the shallow spots are, um, Jackson's Mark middle ground um, for circle two. Um, it's a big area where there is a huge pile of rocks, um, which are old ballast from Civil War era ships that were dropped in the harbor, which we can't seem to get removed. But nonetheless, they're still there. And that's about the size of a school bus or two, right? And I think it runs northeast, sort of, right from the from the marker that's so, there. I think they put three, or they have. They keep a. There's a safety boat there, and they have three white balls that kind of mark where that area is. So definitely, do not go sailing inside of those three white yeah. balls. So um, they'll put the rock, and it will hurt your boat quite bad. <laughs> yeah, the organizing authorities, they'll put four white balls around middle ground. Um, it's actually about the size of four school buses. Four. Um, it's placed, um, the rocks are all placed kind of east of the pole, east and south of the pole, um, straight towards the east. Uh, I wouldn't count on that. Um, I've paddleboarded over it, so I know the rocks pretty well. But it is really one of the few places in Charleston Harbor where it is very much rock and if you hit it it will hurt yes absolutely i've seen a viper pretty much ripped in half i think hitting it full speed yeah like 15 16 knots and the keel mm -hmm. just ripped through the back of the boat um but uh you, we also talked about this shallow area here off the point i've seen a lot of people run aground there sometimes if you're sailing in the typical sea breeze direction we don't know if that's going to be the case but yep. more than likely you'll at least get one day of that direction during the uh, Charleston race week this year. And it's pretty important to like get the kite down pretty quickly if you're sailing on course two, um, because you'll you'll come up on it pretty quick. And you definitely don't want to cut this corner on your way to the race course, right? So, yeah, uh, you know, if you're sailing on circle, the, the smaller VX circle and whatever else might be over there, probably going this way around shoots folly, this island here. And then if you're, you could also go that way if you're on circle two, the Melgus 24s and the other boats. Um, but it's also easy to go this way, but just make sure you don't cut it too close, right? Um, yeah. Have a good look at your chart and know where the shallow spots are and the deep spots, because also knowing where the shallow and deep spots are is a really uh, important thing for strategy. Um, there's going to be less current moving in the shallow areas and more current moving in the deeper areas. And the current, is, as it changes every day from uh, an ebb tide to a flood tide, it's going to change sooner in the shallow waters, right? Yeah. So paying attention to that is important. Um, speaking about that, John, as the tide switches, what are some things that we're looking for? Yeah, like, I mean, what do we pay attention <clears throat> to? You know, there's a few key factors as it starts to change. Obviously, it slows down. And then it start, there's not a really long period of slack tide in Charleston. It's it's like almost never really slack for that long. Um, so as it changes, now we're looking at the flood tide picture uh, slide. Uh, what are you looking for tactically and strategically? So you'll see you'll see different varying tide lines across the race course. Um, you know, gauging from shallow water to deep water. I think that's probably one of the bigger bigger tells that you can see one, one thing, um, you know, depending on how calm the water is, how little wind there may be. Um, typically we see the, the real brown murky water is river water on its way out and we'll see the darker water be ocean water on its way in. Um, mm -hmm. And so those are a couple of things, you know, look for, you know, look for those, look for those tide lines, um, look for, you know, the chopped up water, to see that, but um, you know, all in all, if, if you pay attention to the to the depths on your race course, and and get an appreciation for how those depths will change the current across the course, the tide lines will really become pretty apparent on on what side's going to be better or not. Um, right. And so when they come these, in, they start in the shallow water and then they move towards yeah. the deeper water, right? Right. So come in on the on the bottom edge of our screen here. There's no land in this shot, but that's just about where James Island starts. Um, and then they'll march north towards the channel. Right. So yeah. and it'll probably if it's starting to flood, you'll probably be a little greener water like you talked about. 
And then also I think paying attention to the texture of the water, depending upon which way the wind is blowing can be really indicative of what's happening on a tide line. And uh, sometimes it's not the water's moving the opposite direction. Sometimes it's just that another level of velocity is coming in essentially. Yeah. So, you know, if the, if the wind is a, is against the tide or the current, then it's going to be choppier, right? So if there's a tide line and both, both sides of the tide line are against the wind or the currents against the wind, one side will be choppier than the other. And that will be the one that has more current in it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, I mean, that's, I think that's pretty fair. Um, one of the things I will say, um, as, as somebody who's been here for a while and had a uh, hundred people ask me what I thought about the tides and, you know, what, what local knowledge I have to offer for Charleston race week, you know, what I tell people is, is stick with your gut nine times out of 10, you know, wind shifts will prevail over tide. Um, you know, the, the less wind there is, the more the tide will play into factor. Um, fortunately we've had some good breeze in the last, you know, few Charleston race weeks. And so the, the wind has, has played the bigger factor. Um, having sailed with a bunch of different tacticians, you know, very, very good tacticians over the last few years, you know, I, I literally, I trust them more than I trust myself. Um, and so I kind of looking, you know, looking at Charleston race week as, as an event, I, I think it's, you know, it, still the best sailors survive here. Um, wind is wind is everything. Knowing how the current affects you uh, on the starting line, knowing how it affects you um, at marks and and how it affects your lay lines right. is, is really the critical part. All of these race yeah. circles that we have for the VXs, for the you know the Melgus 24s and J70s and, and and in the big boats that are a little bit further out, most of the time, the current is going to be running across the race course at the same direction and the same velocity. And, and just how you play your percentages of, of, you know, whether it's port tack upwind, you know, short port tack or long starboard tack upwind um, and vice versa downwind. <clears throat> if the current's running across the race course, you know, the, the weather beat might be correct, but the downwind might be skewed. Just mm -hmm. understanding how that affects the race and, you know, affects the percentages of the race course, I think is the most important part about trying to anticipate the current in Charleston. Right. I, I don't, I don't think there's a magic bullet that local people have that, you know, know where some weird back eddy is. Um, you know, we just don't see that happen that often. Um but you did speak a little bit about the start and the ley lines. You know, yep. uh, one thing that I like to use, and I'm, I know you use it too, because we've sailed together in Charleston quite a bit. But if you're, say you're on a starboard tack ley line to the weather mark, you're looking through the mark and then onto something on land, just like you would do for a line site. And yep. you, your bow might be pointed at that mark, but if you watch the land, you're not moving in that direction, right? You're getting swept one way or the other in the current. And so putting the bow or the boat at an angle to where the mark is not no longer moving on the land means you're actually heading dead at that mark. Right. Yeah, so the, the transit is super crucial. Important. Yeah, the, you know, you'll, you'll realize that you can be bowed down if you're on the ley line and getting swept up way sooner than yeah. uh, if you're not using that. And, you know, it's something that can really kind of pay great dividends. You can also say, maybe you think you're thin on the ley line and you're getting swept up if you're looking at the transit, you know that you're gaining positive ground to weather. You're gauging to weather. So that's yeah. a conversation as a tactician um, that I'm always having with the driver being like, we're still we're still not going at the mark. Let's put the bow down or up a little bit to make sure that we're actually maximizing our, our direction towards yeah. the mark. Those are, those are just simple range bearing markers. You know, as, as, like Jackson said, as you look through the mark uh, to a point on land, if, if you're holding steady, on that point, then then you are approaching that mark. If you're gaining bearing on the mark, then you know you need to put the bow down a little bit and and try to you know close that range at a different angle. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and again, those are just something like anybody who sailed in any kind of current is going to look at. Um, and unfortunately, racing in Charleston Harbor is pretty easy to do. Um, once you start, you know, get an eye on the weather mark you're going to tell if you're gaining or losing on that mark, you know, based on that, 
on that range bearing marker. Um, so keeping an eye on that is, is definitely, if you're not used to sailing in current, um, it's definitely something important. I grew up on a lake in Austin, Texas, and I always had these friends of mine come over, um, you know, that never dealt with current before. And, and that was, you know, for, for somebody who's never seen something like this before, it, that's probably the biggest thing that you can look at is just, is just seeing how that affects your ley lines, affects your, you know, the starting line, weather mark roundings, lured mark roundings. I think it makes a big difference. Right, right. And also realizing, depending on which way the current is flowing in relation to the, the angle of the line, whether right. it might be easier or harder to start right. at one end or the other. Right. right. Or pushing you, pushing you over pushing the line. You over, or you holding you back. The time and distance becomes a big deal. Um, the ley lines to the boat and the pin become a big deal. Um, you know, I've, there's been times, I guess John and I were sailing together last year and uh, the current was holding everyone back from the line. And mm -hmm. it's pretty easy to sneak in at the boat at the last second because people aren't paying attention to the to their transits or or their um you know the the GPS box machine and they're not gaining any ground towards it. So mm -hmm. you know, get out there, get a feel for it, see how the water's moving. Always try to know is the water going starting to get faster or is it slowing down and about to change? I think is a big thing too, right? Mm -hmm. so putting that into your plan that oh it's speeding up or it's slowing down. Um, yeah. all those things can be really, really handy. Um, if you're, if you're using a Velocitech or a Rockeros type system where you've got time and distance to the line, you know, doing a practice time run, um, you know, starting a clock at hundred meters and seeing how quickly you can race to the starting line, you know, those kind of pre-race, you know, tools are, are really important, um, because you can, you can get a feel for how quickly you're approaching the line or how, or how slowly you're approaching the line. Uh, our, our PROs for all these events will certainly harp on you if you're pushing the line, you're getting this set up too early, you're gonna be over because we wanna run as many races as we can. And so look for the, look for the race committee guys to start jumping on everybody. But um, these are the, some, some tips that you can, you know, start to do before your race, do a little homework and uh, make sure you're, you know, in the right spot. Right, right. And I, I think another thing is thinking about how the current affects your opponent <clears throat> wind. If if you're if they're, if you're getting swept up into the wind, if, if you were on port and with the sea breeze direction here on the other slide, uh the one before it, I guess, but it might make the boat easier to sail. Or in this case, you'd be on port sailing up wind to the weather mark from the sea breeze direction, and it would be like a apparent wind header and like decrease the power in the boat. And just making sure that you realize that. So when the boat feels not great, you're like, okay, well, that's probably why at this moment, but it feels so much better on the other tack kind of deal. It's kind of an interesting, yeah. interesting scenario, right? Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah. All right. So we got, uh, we have, um, we're there to help fix any sales or any problems you have. Um, I think John, you and uh, Irvin will be blasting around in a powerboat. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so we um, we we want to do everything we can to offer the best service um, for any of our clients that we can um, with overnight sail repairs. While they, um, you know, they may be they may be big, they may be small. We still want to take care of you. Um, due to the nature of the venue, um, it's it's going to be a little bit easier for us to pick sails up by powerboat. Um, there will be boats docked at Patriots Point Marina. There'll be boats at Carolina Yacht Club, Charleston Yacht Club, the City Marina, Seabreeze. And so Irvin's going to be out in his powerboat um, every afternoon picking sails up for repair. Um, if you give us a call, let us know where you are. That's going to be the best route to take. Um, save our numbers. Send us a text message. Send, you know, Give us a call. Let us know where you are. We want to try to make this as easy as possible for you. Um, you know, with this, with this new venue, um, it's a pretty good hike from the Patriots Point Marina up to the parking lot. So we want to save you that legwork. Um, we can come down to Patriots Point, meet you at the fuel dock, meet you at the College of Charleston. Um, organizing, organizing that up, you know, sort of as soon as you know you have a problem is, is the best route to take. Um, I'll, I'll be sailing, Irvin will be sailing shoot us a text message, let us know you have an issue. We'll pick it up. 
we'll get it to the loft. We'll get it fixed. We'll get it back to your boat um, before you're at the boat in the morning. So um, best thing to do for us is, is, is just get, get in touch with us. We've got a, there's a ton of North sales salesmen's going to be at this event. They all have our contact info. Um, reach out to us and we will get you squared away. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. All right. So there's a few other things happening uh, before and after this event, right? We got Fort to battery. That's a pretty cool thing. It's uh, yep. any type of boat you race from Fort Sumter to the battery, right? It's been pretty epic some years. Yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's the fastest seven-minute race um, in history. We we run it. Um, it's going to be on the thirteenth. It'll run from Fort Sumter to the Battery um, or 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 back, depending on the wind direction. Um, it's 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 a great event. We we typically get um, well over a hundred people in kiteboards, catamarans, moths, um, you name it, uh, to participate. Um, those guys do a great job. It, it, it's something to certainly not be missed if you're in town early. Um, they do, they run it out of James Allen Yacht Club and it's been, it's been very popular for the last 15 years or so. Having done it a couple of times, um, I know not to wear myself out before Charleston race week, but, um, <laughs> it, it, it is a great event. And then the very next day we have our Cora Spring Harbor race. If, if you are on a big boat, you get there early um cora is going to run windward lured races out in the middle of the harbor kind of on that circle two circle three course um there it's going to be open to everyone if, if you're there all you have to do is uh check in on channel 74 and we can give you information from there um we we do want to welcome people cora is cora was the the founder of charleston race week and and they are looking to do everything they can to to help um, to help every everybody who's coming in and out of town. So good opportunity to get some practice racing in, get used to the current. Um, like I said, if you're if you're in town early, I know there will be a bunch of boats um, ready to be itching to sail. And then we we also have two kind of great great regattas after Charleston Race Week. We're looking to sort of build on um, our Charleston Yacht Club J105 Women's Regatta is April 27th. Um, we had about eight boats do it last year. And, and so this is an all women's event uh, that Charleston Yacht Club runs and um, just a good event. I know that we've got about 12 or 13 J105s registered. If they wanna keep their boats in town, maybe charter them out, maybe find a women's team to put them on. I think it's, a, it's just a fantastic opportunity. I have a J105 and uh, we have a group of girls that go race our boat. And oftentimes I think they do a better job than we do. Um, <laughs> and then uh, Charleston Yacht Club is also putting on a August 20 and August 32 <laughs> regatta on May 4th and 5th after race week. Um, this is an opportunity for anybody doing race week to keep their boats in Charleston with their masts up for free for another couple of weeks to do two regattas. Um, we <laughs> recognize that big turnout for the 32s this year right we have a big you know, we have 10 malgus 32s registered we, you know the first fleet of malgus 20s back in charleston you know super excited i do a lot of malgus 20 racing down in miami and they were they were super pumped to get the opportunity to come back to charleston and so we're, we're hoping to see some of these you know great fleets um rebuild in a you know different different venue different spot um but we also appreciate how hard it is to move these boats around um and and so charleston yacht club wants to do everything they can to make it as easy on you as possible so they are trying like crazy to offer in the water storage on land storage masked up storage if you want so reach out to those yacht clubs you know see what she what you can come up with you know, look look for the Cora Spring Harbor Race. Look for the the Charleston Yacht Club Regattas. These are these are just great events that you know kind of pivot around Charleston Race Week. We want to try to do everything we can to make both Charleston Race Week and these these standalone events um, better and better every year. Yeah, absolutely. And Cora stands for Charleston o Ocean Racing Association, right? That's right. Yep. yep. Yeah. Yep. I remember when I was a member of Cora back in the day. There's a lot of great people putting that mm -hmm. stuff together. Um, so before we leave, John, give me your three favorite restaurants in Charleston. Three favorite restaurants. Um, 
so many restaurants to choose from. There's a ton uh, of them, and they're all pretty darn good. I'm gonna I'm gonna pick Oak uh, Steakhouse as my my favorite steakhouse. Uh, yeah. I'm gonna pick um, Taco Boy. As, yes, that's a great my spot. Favorite um, taco spot right downtown. And then I'm gonna go with uh, Home Team for uh, the best, the, one of the one a good barbecue outdoor venue uh, right on the peninsula. So. Right. Right. Those and what, are some of things. what about three places to hang out after racing if you done if uh, aircraft carriers are already done and gone? Oh man, oh, there's too many. Um, <laughs> you know, on Wednesday nights, Salt to Mike's after the uh, North Sales gather up will be the the place to be. Um, Salt to Mike's is a is a local sailing bar right downtown. It's just it's really been incredible. Um, but you know, anywhere after. After the meal uh, at race week, or if you get a chance to go out downtown, anywhere on King Street is just, there's just, there's too many places, you know, Jackson and I have unfortunately been in most of them for, for a lot of years. Um, it's just a lot of fun. Um, this is, this is a great venue, Charleston, you know, I, I'm, I'm obviously a bit partial, but um, Charleston is just a great place to hang out. I, I, I would be remiss to try to pick one spot. Uh, I think there's too many spots to try. Um, find something you like. Uh, I know that there's a lot of fleets and teams that try to find local meetups. And I think those are awesome. You know, as we can see these, the camaraderie between these groups grow and grow, um, you know, with the VX1 fleet, the J70 fleet, I think it's, it's incredible. And so, um, you know, I encourage everybody to, to continue to do that. Um, and, you know, find, find your spot, find your, find your place in Charleston, because there's enough of them. If, if you do have any questions or concerns about where to go, hit, hit, you know, hit me or Jackson up. Jackson knows where to go as, as well as anybody. Um, so mm -hmm. truly come enjoy the week. Um, you know, I think, I think it's Charleston is an amazing venue. Like anything it's, it's gone through a bit, some changes and um, you know, we're excited to see how, see how this next generation of Charleston race week plays out. I think, um, you know, the organizers have done an amazing job in securing its, its future. And, um, we want to, we want to have it, make sure that Charleston puts on its best for you. And so everybody's working hard at it. Um, you know, let us know if you have any questions, we've got some time here for some chat. If anybody has any questions, um, on the group chat, throw, throw them out. But if you want to, email me or Jackson or hit up any of the Charleston's or North sales salesmen. We're going to have a whole, whole army of people there. There'll so be a bunch of them, them, right? I mean, Rich Bowen, I think Nick Turney, yeah. Rizzo McKenzie, Mike Marshall, Allen, Max Finnecker, Jeff Hayden, Irvin. Uh, I might end up there. My uh, August 2014 yeah. seems not to do it a little late, but that's great. Uh, maybe I'll just show up and get in a coach boat or something. Who knows? I got a boat for you. Oh, mate. Oh, yeah. All right. So. All right. So the water, though, one last thing, I guess, to leave everybody with while we're waiting, if there are any questions about the current tide or anything in this presentation, uh, it's kind of chilly, colder than normal, John. Uh, you know, as I sit here on the beach, it is a lot colder than normal. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the best part about Charleston weather is uh, wait a couple of days and you'll get something totally different. So uh, you might wait 10 minutes and it will change. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, um, yeah, it should be a great week. I look forward to seeing everybody out there. Yeah. All right, John. Well, thanks for uh, joining us and everyone else that, that uh, signed up and joined us and this will be recorded. It'll be on YouTube, right? So if you want to go watch it again, or if you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to call John or I, we're happy to help. It's what we're here for. We enjoy doing it. Um, and I guess we will see you in Charleston. All oh, right. Well, we, we got one chat question. here. Okay. We got Frank McNamara. If the current is stronger against the James Island shore, does it make sense to go on starboard and get the current first? go on port first and get the current lift when it's stronger. So, well, the current is stronger in the channel. It's not stronger really on the shore. And so depending on the axis of the race course and if the current's going to be giving you a boost or it's going to be holding you back, kind of dictates how that plays out, right? Um, but I think also what John talked a lot about is, you know, the current can sometimes become a little kind of get tunnel vision with that. So I think just understanding the basic 
ideas and foundation of it's going to get there's going to be more current up there so we got to plan for that but still being playing the shifts um is the larger key especially in the sea breeze direction it gets quite shifty up at the top right john uh the land's coming over the wind uh the wind's coming over the land and it can be uh puffy and shifty up there so setting yourself up from the right side with the current is probably a good idea knowing how it's going to affect your ley line is it going to be easier to lay the mark or harder to lay the mark use your transit but uh i think mainly it obviously depends on the axis of the course and i wouldn't let it get too deep into your don't let it take over your whole game plan, I guess, is what we're trying to say. Yeah, you know, I think, um, you know, sailing on sailing on the race course, if you're sailing up near the James Allen shore, um, you know, recognizing where the channel is, um, there is a but point. It's strong in the channel, and then it, as you get closer to the shore, you'll see right. the channel markers, and then it gets shallower, right? So then yeah. it's getting less strong right john so we, we will we will obviously we'll, we'll a lot of times if we're sailing out of a sea breeze direction we'll set weather marks um on the opposite side of the channel closer to james island and so the current will start to get less as you get closer to the island um as it gets shallower um but that said as you get closer to james island the breeze gets shiftier and so I think you'd be, you know, real remiss to ignore the wind. Um, you know, watching the breeze tends to be sort of more important. Um, looking for me, looking for trends um, over anything else is is the most important thing. Um, you know, and and its relation to ley lines. Um, and again, like Jackson said, it, it depends on where your race course is, depends on the access of the axis of the wind. Um, there's a lot of variables, and you know, we we wanted to try to focus on sort of being aware of the current, understanding what it's doing to you on the race course, um, as opposed to to hammering into the specifics of you know a specific beat, because you know we we race in so many different places throughout the harbor um, in Charleston Race Week, and, and we've done so for a long time. So, you know, I think being aware of it. Knowing, knowing where that, you know, if you're, if you're sailing up that James Island shore, knowing when it starts to get shallower is, is going to be an important part when that current starts to slack off as you get closer to James Island um, is, is a big important factor. So that's, that's what I'd look out for my advice to you. Um, you know, there, there's some good channel markers in that river, um, BP, AR-15, all the way out to R2 um, are the channel markers on the James Island side. And so Keep an eye out for those. And, you know, again, look at your charts, knowing where the deep water is. The Ashley River is still a working channel. And so it is dredged to appropriate depths. Um, and so we will see that channel pretty well defined um, on the chart. And I think that's where that's where Jackson's arrows got bigger um, on the charts is is right down that river. Um, we right. see a little bit deeper water. Yep. And I think also, you know, there's every time I sail past something anchored in Charleston Harbor or Crab Trap or anything, I'm yep. always looking at it like to see if it's changing or if the angle, the angle is changing or is it speeding up, slowing down, you know, and then obviously it's going to change every day in the middle of the day and looking for the telltale signs we talked about, the water color change as it starts to flood, right? The texture of the water, the current lines as they move away from shore um, and all, you know, realizing how to capitalize on the change, noticing the factors that are being shown to you about how it's changing and knowing which side of the line you want to be on of those current lines. And it's, yeah. it's, there's, it's yeah. there's, no, there's no shortage of crab pots in the area. So, um, and we have crab pots, not lobster pots. Um, they will be a real pain, um, but there's no shortage of them. And so being able to see how the current's changing across the race course is something that is, pretty easily done. You know, you, you don't have to be a, you know, a top level team with a coach boat telling you exactly what the current's doing. Um, like Jackson said, every chance I sail past something that's, that's anchored to the bottom, I'm looking at how that water is moving differently. Absolutely. Every chance you get, right? Yeah, absolutely. Every chance you get. Well, cool. uh, thank everyone for joining us. It's been yeah. a fun time. And uh, as we said a few times, please don't hesitate to reach out. We're here to help. We love doing it. Um, and we'd love to help you with anything we can. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you, Jackson. All right. Thank you, John. Have a good yeah. one, guys. See you in yeah. Chuck Town. Yeah.